What I'm talking about this morning uh, follows a training uh, that we did last week. And if you want to know more about that training, there's a link under this video where you can uh, find out a little bit more about it. That's not working. I, I'll put a link in after. So we delivered our books on the ground training uh, on Friday last week. And following that training, uh, that one day training comes with a 28 day uh, follow on support. And we had some one to ones yesterday. <clears throat> and what we do here is, is we train property investors to make more profit from their refurbishment projects. Now, and this particular chap uh, wanted to know where the cheapest place was to buy their tiles. Now, I understand the question, like genuinely, I get it totally. I get where you wanna buy the cheapest tiles from, if that's what your uh, success metric is based on, the cheapest. But profit is the thing with that. Profit doesn't exist in a cheap box of tiles. If it's taking you two, three, four, five days to find a box of tiles that's maybe in a sale or discontinued or got the first and last tile in the packet is broken or it's end of line or whatever that is. Profit does not exist there. Just because that box of tiles used to be 50 quid and you can get it for a tenner because it's cheap, that is not where your profit exists on a project. And if you're in that mindset of shopping around for the cheapest stuff in order to make more profit from your projects, you're gonna be left really, really disappointed. All of your profit, well, the majority of your profit is on the clock. The clock is where your profit is. So if you're dicking about trying to save 40 quid on a box of tiles, you are losing money. You are losing profit. 100% every time. Time is your biggest cost on any project. Every single time. Even when you're one of these guys that says, uh, my labor's free, I don't charge my own time. Uh, I'm doing all the work myself. If you're in that club, this still applies. It still applies to you. And you can only drive time efficiencies on a project using a programmer works. That programmer works is going to allow you to plot start date, finish date, milestone check-ins, delivery dates, schedules, uh, when designs need to be done by, when your materials need to be on site by, plotting in your skips, your payments, your invoicing, your lending, uh, when your rental can start, when it can go on the market, and you can plot out your whole project using a programmer works. You can plot out your whole year if you've got multiple projects running. But if you're not using a program and you don't know that information that I just ran through there, you're running inefficiently. If you do nothing else on your projects, if you think I talk shit, if you think that tiles is the best place to make your profit, cheap tiles, then that's great. But if that is you, get a program as well. Get a program that works on them projects and you watch your world immediately change. Immediately. You will remove overwhelm. You will have a structured plan for your weeks, your months, your year. Because without that, without a plan, without a strategy, you're leaving everything to chance. Everything. Like bar nothing. I'll give you a quick example of this. We've just programmed out a project that's on the plotter was 42 was it 42 or 46? I think it was 42 weeks. 42 weeks. Am I running costs for 42 weeks just for management, just for no work, no production, just time? What's 58,000 quid? 58 grand. Now, if I didn't know that period, that cost would have been missed. The cost would have been missed off my uh, forecast. And that's not a good place to be. Also, if that project then took me two years, instead of one because I don't have a program to be driving and I don't have anything to run efficiencies on that job if it took two years I've then got 116 grand cost coming to me that I didn't know was coming it's imperative that you have this haggling with tradesmen over their prices and rates I want to share with you a, a forum is it a forum is that the right word I think it is. A forum I was part of, I am part of, for plasterers. 
Uh, I'm not a plasterer per se. I can plaster, but not a plasterer. And there was some heated debate going off about what the current market rate was in this particular group. And there were guys in there sharing that the contractor they were working for had haggled their prices down to under two pound a square meter. Two quid. I ain't getting out of bed for that. Two pound a square meter. Mental. Um, you know, these guys are basing this price on volume, continuity of work. No need to market, no need to go out pricing at work. They've just turned up and get two quid a meter. I get that approach. Somebody put them there though. And this is what I want to share with you today. There's no way they went in to price that job and said, oh, I'll do you that for two quid. They might have gone in at six or seven. And the quantity surveyor or the main contractor, the person holding the purse strings, has chipped them down to two quid. And they've gone ahead. When you do this, morning. When you do this, you will sacrifice quality. Because they need to put it on quicker in order to earn the same amount of money as when they did when they put their initial price in. You have to work longer and therefore be more tired, as it were. So quality is always going to suffer when you do that. That's not what I wanted to focus on this morning. What I want to talk about this morning is this is not where profit exists. There's so many people I've trained now over the past couple of years. Um, so what we do here is train property investors to make more profit from their refurb projects. And they believe that profit li lives here lives in chipping at trades, lives in bargain basement uh, products, the screw fix sale, the B&Q underlying discounts. That's not where profit lives. Profit lives in the effective management of a programmer works. By the time you've chipped three quid off that plasterer and got a worse job than you would have done if you've paid him what he was due, or what he initially priced, due was probably the wrong phrase. You could have been so much more advanced in your project so much further on in your project the quicker you move through that project the more profit you will make i cannot stress this point enough time is your number one i'm, I'm sick of saying it is your number one factor on any project if i say anything this morning by the way drop your questions in below what questions do you have about this So time, having that programmer works is going to allow you to manage that project through, to manage the process through from start to finish. It gives you them check-in dates. It allows you to align deliveries, um, inspections, finance, refinancing, your lending, when your tenant can move in or when you can put it on the market. All of these things are the thing where profit lives profit lives in time if you're running an operation that's running at a thousand quid a week for example which is probably average once you've added up all your prelim costs and all your overhead if you're running at a grand a week and you're spending a week haggling over three quid a meter with your plasterer yeah you might have saved 200 pound you've spent a grand in doing so and it's a nuts approach When you haggle guys down to that sort of price as well, by that margin, they will leave you for 10 pence a meter. That, I guarantee it. I see this all the time. All the time. Brickies are the worst for it, by the way, for those that are watching. Yes, I was bricky. Brickies will cross the road for 10 pence. Go on to another site for 10 more P. So looking after them trades and them projects is massively important. When I say looking after, I don't mean paying over the odds. I don't mean that there's no room for negotiation. There's no room for manoeuvre. But when you thrash their price down to such a degree like that, that will impact you in the long run. Be it in time, be it in relationships, be it in something. But all of those things, the output is less profit, ultimately. I have got so much stuff happened yesterday, I say happened. 
had that many amazing conversations with people uh, looking to make more profit from their refurbishment projects. Um, I actually didn't know what to can share this morning. Uh, it, it, it was that good. Uh, so many conversations, so much productivity came out of the back of it. Uh, but one thing I wanted to particularly share was uh, some feedback I got from my book. Uh, a guy sent me a message saying that he now owes, he's read my book, client, he now owes his builder an apology. And I was kind of, you know, what, what do you mean? Why, why do you owe your builder an apology? And he had the realisation after reading the book that um, how shit a client he'd been, his words. Uh, I'd been a really shit client. I didn't provide a specification, didn't provide a, a program of works. And I didn't set my expectation, didn't communicate anything. I literally just gave this guy the keys and let him crack on. Uh, and what I've realised is, what this guy realised is, uh, how, how that's impacted his business, his profit, and how how that's made him so unprofessional, so uh, not a good client. You know, he, he said that he was having a go at the builder when he turned up on site and he, he, he was uh, producing snag lists that weren't relative to the specification. Um, and and he, he openly admitted that the builder was never gonna be able to uh, meet his expectation because he never communicated the expectation in the first place. So how, how can the builder in this example, and, and I'm sure that this is a really common theme, how can, how can, so I'll, I'll say it for me, if, I, if me as the builder, if I'm working for a client, be it distance, be it local, but it doesn't matter. If you don't tell me what your expectations are in terms of standards, in terms of uh, payment, time, budget, any of that, if, you don't, if I don't know that information, I can't meet it. I can't meet that expectation. And that's what this guy was saying. Uh, so really chuffed that he reached out and shared that with me. Uh, must've took a lot as well. Must have damaged the old ego a little bit to read a book that was literally talking about him. Uh, so yeah, it was a great, uh, great share. So if you are listening, uh, I really appreciate that that message that you sent. I want to show you this morning. I uh, got a email last night off a chap, uh, pissed off that another tradesman has used photos of his work on on his ad, and asked me if it was. A breach of copyright. Now, I don't have the answers to everything, and I don't know the answer either. But I jumped on to talk about it to see if it has happened to you. Or, in fact, have you done it? Have you done this? What's happened to this guy? This guy was a, uh, a landscaper, and some some guy screenshotted some of his finished work and used it on one of his ads passing it off to be his. Now, is that a breach of copyright was the question. That was the question that I got asked. Um, I don't think it is. I don't think it is a breach of copyright. I think for, some, for a breach of copyright to occur, a copyright has to be in place, but I don't know. I'm no solicitor, I'm no patent expert in any way, shape or form. But what I wanted to ask you is that this happened to proper investors. This is an, I'd see this regular. Morning. See this regular where people um, share photos of their finished projects, their finished work. They share photos of their properties. And I see people screenshot them and share them as their own, which is a bit naughty. But is it a breach of copyright? No, I don't think it is. There's two ways of looking at it. We can get pissed off when someone does that to us. Or be flattered. Someone screenshotting my work and passing it off as theirs. I think I'd be flattered. And it's absolutely not uh, honourable. Is that a word? Honourable. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, calling it out on the ad. It's another way, yeah. Yeah, I'd be flattered. And I think uh, my comment would be something along the lines of, I really appreciate you sharing photos of my work. Or something like that. Worse to that effect. Uh, you know, I won't get angry, I won't get pissed off about it. I take it as flattering. Some companies give you pics to be able to do their training and get started on a Facebook page. I did not know that. It's amazing when you think about that. I 
I've done it. I've screenshotted people's work, but not to pass off as my own. I've done it to share a piece of content, maybe, you know, ask someone's opinion on a finish or a product. I've done that. Here's a photo of a, I did it recently with a big set of sliders. They're like six meters tall or something. And I screenshot that and shared it. I didn't try and pass it off my, as my own. Uh, I don't want to get opinions on it. This morning I want to share with you a conversation I had yesterday with one of my clients, one of my training clients. So all that, at all levels of training that we offer, including the free training, my book, Boots on the Ground, the 28 day program, In the Trenches, the three month program, and the Select, the 12 month program, the hardest thing I have to get people past is the cost of time. It is the hardest thing for me to get across, the mindset shift. And this is probably, if you're listening and this triggers you, this is probably you as well. So this is a guy that's planning out his project. He showed it me, showed me the plan. And the, the very first thing I've picked up on is he's planning on doing his own rip out. Morning, Jack. Morning, France and morning, New Zealand. He's planning on doing his own rip out and his own decorating. Because of the, the old mindset thought process of, I'll do that myself, it'll save me some money. It won't save you any money. It will cost you money. Doing it at evenings and weekends, it will cost you money. That property is a liability until it is finished. It does not become an asset until that project is complete. It won't save you any money. He knows this as well. He knows this. But having this shift in mindset of, of paying someone to do something that you're capable of doing is massive. It is the hardest thing for me to teach at all levels when I'm teaching this. It comes with so many arguments in the classroom, online, in person, one-to-one, -one, whatever. It co always comes with a row, always. There's always someone that says, yeah, but I enjoy it. You're full of shit. You do not enjoy it. You enjoy spending time with your family. You enjoy going to the cinema. You enjoy whatever it is that you do in your spare time. Nobody enjoys stripping wallpaper or decorating. You can try and convince me all you like. I'll never believe you. Stuff that we enjoy, we pay for. We pay for things that we enjoy. Go to the footy, go to the pub, whatever that is. It comes at a cost, money out of our pocket, we pay for it. There is no way on God's earth that anybody would pay to go and have a day's wallpaper stripping or they would pay to go and have a day at decorating. You don't enjoy it. That is simply a justification for you. It's a justification for you to excuse the fact that you're doing it yourself. I enjoy it. Bullshit. Morning, Steve. I've just realized this, this is not about you, by the way. <laughs> this is another Steve. So getting the cost of time understood is absolutely critically important for you to make the most amount of profit from your projects. Every time, and it is all in here. It's a hard thing to get your head around. It's a hard thing to get your head around when it comes to understanding this. But you must if you want to make more profit from them projects. I can't get the staff. Uh, the word... Um, what I want to talk about is the end of that sentence. Uh, what comes out the back of that, I can't get the staff. I, can't, I hear this a lot from property investors when I deliver a training or a masterclass. It often comes up as a question. I can't get the subbies to deliver to my program. I can't get the subbies to do this. I can't get the builder to do this, uh, etc., etc. Now, what I want to shift your focus to is the word that's been used, uh, get, the word get. Get implies persuasion and it implies something you're trying to force someone to do, like, I'm trying to get them to do this. Uh, my coach, Matt, calls it uh, get energy. 
Uh, well, he actually says, see if I can do his accent, he says, go to an Drew. I think I nailed it. He's a brummy. So that get energy, that persuasive energy, it's, it's not going to serve you and it won't work, particularly with subbies. And here's why. Uh, builders and trades that listen into this, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, or maybe not. Um, Self-employed, sole traders, uh, tradesmen, builders, whatever you want to call them, are exactly that, self-employed. They don't like, generally speaking, they don't like being told what to do. Um, by virtue of them, on it. By virtue of them being self-employed, that's why they went self-employed, right? Most have big egos. And that's okay too, as long as you know this. Don't like being told what to do. Don't like to be directed. Don't like being told the militant directness of an instruction. Most don't like that, don't appreciate it. So here's how we're gonna get around that. Move out of that get energy that you're trying to get them to do something. What we gotta look at when, when we're doing that, I bring this, um, I bring this teaching this morning from my corporate days. It was always client versus builder. So the builder sat on one side of a fence. Imagine it as a game of tennis. Builder and trade sat on one side and the client at the other. It's point scoring. Who can get this done? How can we trip the builder up here to get more out, more value from our money? And it was always client versus builder. It, that relationship always existed. It was never a team, it was always one versus the other. And I see this all the time in property as well. I can't get the builder to do this. Now, if you shifted the client and the builder to one side of that tennis court net and left the project on the other, the game completely changes. So you, rather than client versus builder, you become client and builder versus project. That's the battle you should be having. Client and builder should be the team and then the project becomes the opponent. That's the thing you have to beat. That's the game you have to win. Not the, there's, There should never be a battle between client and builder. That will never ever serve anybody. Everybody will lose. Everybody will lose. And, and the bigger the project is, the more this will come to light. Let's say you're working on a, I don't know, multi-thousand, multi-million pound project. Biggest project I ever worked on was 18 million pound. And that was very much client versus builder. We was always trying to, as the builder, we was always trying to trip up the client for extras, get more money out of them. That was my job in my corporate days. And the client was always sat on his side of the fence what can we get extra here? How can we batter the subby? How can we beat them down on a rear? How can we get round this? How can we sting them for holding us up? How can we sting them for losses? And there's always that battle, always. But imagine an 18 million pound project and the client and builder sit around the table as a team and handle the challenges of the project rather than the challenges of one another. Absolute game changing stuff this and it sounds so simple and that's because it is really simple team versus project not client versus builder uh, and apply this to everything any type of project domestic commercial doesn't matter apply this same theorem to that and you'll always win you win the game as a team uh, I did a random masterclass last night, as some of you may well know, some of you may well attended. Uh, great event, as always. Um, and one, a question that came up. Oh, I've got myself in the right mess here. A question came up um, that I wanted to handle this morning. Something around the lines of sometimes uh, spending more will make you more profit. And uh, what I mean by that, it's something I said on a masterclass and somebody challenged it, um, is, Try and put it into a real life example. Uh, I did a refurb project the back end of last year, was it October time? October, November, one of my own projects. 
and uh, I paid more for the plastering than I normally would. And people say, well, how did that make you more profit? And here's why. I'm trying, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I'll break it down into what's essentially the same example. Um, we got three prices back from three different plasters. The first one was 2K, the second one was 2.5K, and the third one was 3K. The first one was eight weeks away from starting. The second one was six weeks away from starting. And the third one could start immediately. Now, I went with the most expensive, so I paid the 3K. So I paid a thousand pound more for the plastering, but what it saved me was eight weeks in time, which actually saved me around about 2,300 quid, because that's what my time costs me on that particular project. So whilst paying more for the plaster, the, the, the overarching, the global view of the project, I actually saved money, which in turn meant that I made more profit. Uh, this is why managing your time is so much more important than haggling with subbies over 50p a meter. I see this all the time. I've even seen guys in merchants arguing over 20 pence of, of a bag of cement. That is not where profit lives. Profit lives in managing your time effectively and efficiently. And one of the guys, one of the property investors uh, shared with me that what I do is the meat in the sandwich. I, I loved it, I love the analogy. So most property investors and builders and trades as well uh, are, if we, if we look at a property investor first, they're great at finding deals, uh, buying property and also selling it. So the, 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 the bread, if you like, the, the bottom piece of bread and the top piece of bread, but the piece that's missing the refurb, the bit where the money's made, the profit, where the adding value exercise takes place, the meat, uh, that was where they was left lacking. And the builders and trades that are here as well uh, this week, also same problem. So go and view a property. Um, you know, the, the bottom slice of the bread, I hope you're getting this analogy, I am sound like a right dick. The bottom slice of the bread and then the top, the invoicing. So we go and look at it, do the viewing, try price it up. Uh, but without an approach, without a strategy, to price it up, you know, we can miss stuff, um, stuff can bite us, all them things. And then the invoicing at the end, making sure that we've captured everything. So the middle part, the meat in the sandwich, uh, that's what I want to do for you. So my message this morning is for those uh, property investors, property educators, those people that uh, may be watching, maybe tuning in, may want to share this, uh, is I want to offer some help and that is if you guys have a uh, podcast or uh, an opportunity to interview me, uh, get us on a networking event, whatever that is, uh, where you think I can add some value to your clients or add some value to your world, your audience, uh, drop me a message. I'm more than happy to do that, no charge. And I want to talk this morning about the, uh, the three quote gang. Folk that go out to get three quotes from the market. We just delivered a two day refresher training last week uh, for some of our previous students. I wanted to give them a, a kick up the ass, as it were. So we called them in for uh, a bit of a session. And folk that obsess over getting three quotes for each piece of work is a, uh, it's a waste of time. Because you have to know why you're doing it. You have to know why it is that you're getting three quotes. And this is what I often hear. People getting three quotes, but then they say they're not shopping on price. They're not buying the cheapest. But if that were true, you wouldn't be getting three quotes. So don't bullshit yourself. Because when you're bullshitting yourself, you're gonna create internal conflict with what it is that you're trying to do and what it is that you're trying to achieve. A better skill is to know what you should be paying for something for a certain thing. And then when that quote comes back, making sure that it's aligned with that expectation. That is a much better skill to develop than going out to market and getting three quotes all the time. Because a couple of things are happening when you get three quotes, most likely. You go out and get three quotes for something. And if you're not direct and specific in what it is that you want them to price, they're all gonna be different anyway. I'll give you for an example, just a really simple one. Replace all internal doors. One quote might come back per door. One, co one quote might come back priced on a 20 quid special. And one quote might come back based on oak, fire, oak, oak fire doors. 
with new frames and architrave and plaster patching. If you're not specific on what you want that price to be and what you want it to include, there's absolutely no point in getting three quotes whatsoever. None at all. What it also does is it's going to help you burn through your supply chain, which is not a good thing to have. What I mean by that is, if you've got like go-to guys that you're sending these uh, inquiries out to to get them prices back, well then, if you've got, let's say that you're going to three plasterers and you're going to send this inquiry out to three different plasterers and say, can you price me up this? Price me up this project, price me up this room, whatever that is. Two of them are going to be left disappointed. They are, you're only going to point one, right? If you're getting three, four, five, six, seven, even more. Even more quotes. The more you disappoint them, the more unwilling they will be on future jobs, future projects. So a better thing to do is know what, as I said earlier on, know what your expectation is and then shop by that elemental piece of work based on that expectation and develop that relationship with that same supplier. And that's how you build, dare I say it, your power team, your build team. That's how you build it. It's really simple. Too many folk go out, three quotes for this, three quotes for that. Different Sparky on this job, different plaster on this job, different plumber on this job. What a ball ache that is to try and manage. It really is. Oh, I've only just turned the comments on. Morning all, morning everybody. So there's my morning musings from this morning. If though, if however, and there is nothing wrong with this, if this is you, by the way, if you are shopping on price and you're open and honest with yourself based on that, you are genuinely going out to market to buy the cheapest thing, that's okay. You just have to be honest with yourself that that's what you're doing. Otherwise, you're gonna be left really, really frustrated and expect the delivery, quality and service that you get from that person that you have shopped with based on price to reflect that. And if that is you, make sure that that inquiry that you do send out has some parity across the board. So you're asking for the same thing from everybody and making sure that when them rates and prices come back, that they are all based on... The and it comes from a share, a bit of a painful share in my own construction company. And a load of comments that I see across uh, social media and, and actually... A, a, a trainer as well that is uh, totally against this and that's what I want to share with you today so we priced up a um, extension and a full house refurbishment on a large property at near us and the the revenue for that job was 335,000 and some up but we'll say 335k now our standard terms and conditions in my construction company is 20% of the revenue as a deposit. Now we take that for a number of reasons, which is what I wanted to share. <coughs> it allows us to start procuring the work, start establishing the supply chain, do all our pre-works, order any bespoke materials required for that project that I wouldn't be able to take back, like windows, steel beams, things like that. Structural engineers report that was required, uh, some working drawings, which they asked us to provide as well. So all of these things all come at a pre-start cost, so therefore there's a pre-start invoice due. But here's the thing with that. You word the amount of revenue and the amount of our standard terms. So 335,000, 335, a 20% deposit is quite a hefty sum. And I get that. So what I learned from this was maybe that deposit should be a representative amount of the revenue rather than just a set 20%. Because I understand, no matter what the trust is, that 70 grand is a lot of money to part with up front um, for the things I just described. So I am going to change my own business terms because of this. Because 20% is a large sum. I also want to book the time in my diary, which is also important. So for me, if I was to revisit that again, I might be looking at maybe five or 6%, or maybe just a fixed fee, I don't know. It's something that we need to look at because it's caused a bit of friction between myself and the client, which I didn't like. I didn't like the feeling 
Uh, I don't think they liked it. It wasn't a nice experience for either party sat, sat at that round that table. But what I wanted to get to, the point of this was, if your builders are asking for deposits, there is absolutely nothing wrong with you going back and saying, can you just explain to me what that's for? It is easy. And we did that. That is what happened yesterday. So this conversation ensued. You know, can you tell me what the 70k is for? Or whatever number it was, it was about that. And I start rattling off them things. And client goes, really, that's 70 grand's worth? And they're absolutely right, it's not. So that was a big learn for me yesterday. So we got to look at this. So your deposits that you're taking, builds and trades, should be a representative amount of the revenue. And it's up to you what that amount is. There's no right or wrong here at all for the builder and trades and there's no right or wrong here for the client whether or whether whether you do or whether you don't is that right yeah whether you do or whether you don't want to pay that is gonna gear around a number of things the works the actual the actual scope of work that's getting done your appetite for risk the level of trust you have in the service providers what they got to buy in advance. Lots and lots of things to consider. There is no right or wrong here. Absolutely none. But for me, it would be catastrophic in my business if I was to book in a 335,000 pounds refurbishment project and allocated time in my year to that, then the week before it got canceled. That would be catastrophic. There is no, oh, well, he's, you know, he's doing well. He should be able to jump on another job. That's bullshit. That's absolute bullshit. And this is another reason why we take deposits for projects before the start, because it establishes a level of commitment from the client. And that's another reason why we do it.